Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, the microphone is not working. I do not have a very powerful voice. So if I start to kind of speak more quiet, remind me to try to speak up. Um, so yeah, we haven't seen each other in a bit. I hope you're all doing well. We have only a few weeks left uh, in the course. Um, so I want to remind you first of the projects. Um, I hope that you all have been now exploring and hopefully struggling a little bit because things might not be working, which is a, probably a good uh, signal that you picked the right, uh, right project if everything doesn't go as smoothly uh, as you want. Um, I mean, if it if everything goes great, it doesn't mean that your project is bad. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> um, I I want to also remind you that uh, you are submitting only your report, not the code. So we are not looking at your code base and things like that. So uh, really take that writing seriously. That's why I, in the suggested timeline, I put a big chunk just for writing. And um, I did mention in the in the project description that I'm going to follow the policy of our conferences related to the using uh, chatbots for your as a writing assistance. I personally don't have anything against using that. I also use uh, ChatGPT when I want to polish my text and tweak certain words. You know, um, English is not my native language, uh, so so I'm totally fine with that. Um, have in mind that. Um, the GPT is still not really good at, you know, you give it bullet points and then ask, now write me a paper about this. Um, it's not good at writing that level of, you know, long technical text. And I will immediately notice, and it's not the problem that you used it and maybe you even acknowledge it. Rather, uh, the text itself won't be really good. And since I am judging your whole project on your, you know, what you have written up, then you are doing yourself, uh, you know, um, you're kind of shooting yourself in the foot if you're giving me a fully uh, generated text that's not, you know, concise to the point that doesn't give, you know, this is my, this is the hypothesis I have, and this is what I tried, and this is the explanation of the result I have. Like, I, I expect that level of, uh, you know, rigor. So I, I do not recommend that you do that, not because I have anything specially against it. So I just don't think it's going to work for you to write everything for you. Um, you are also responsible for proofreading any suggest suggestions any tool might give you. Uh, today we are going to talk about the fact that these tools are uh, quote unquote uh, hallucinating. Um, so be aware of that. If you go the route of you know using these tools to write a bigger chunk of text for you, which I do not recommend, then um, yeah, you you really need to be careful about what's uh, written there. The Mistakes might be subtle, but it might think in my head, I might think, oh, you misunderstand the major concept in the course. And you really don't want to do that as well. Okay, any questions about projects? All righty. So let's maybe chat a little bit about what else, what, what's left in the in the course. So uh, we have about three weeks ahead of us. To this week, we are going to talk about a few more applications we that I mentioned kind of in the passing, like reading comprehension and summarization, but we are going to go a little bit more in depth of those tasks. And uh, we are going to, for our algorithms, we are going to just focus on neural algorithms. We want to talk about, just maybe briefly about more traditional approaches. Uh, and next week, I'm going to present more advanced topics related to uh, language, uh, large language models, uh, namely, how do we extend uh, large language models to multimodal inputs? So I will focus only on vision and text, and also what is the state of the art in terms of multilingual uh, large language models, where we train the model in the same fashion we have seen with the uh, English corpus, but now we have a corpus that contains uh, uh, texts of hundreds of uh, languages. Um, so here I'm going to cover one example of each one of these. So for multimodal, we will talk about Lava, and for multilingual, we'll talk about Aya. And then, um, yeah, there were, I want to wrap with various topics in responsible AI. There is a lot to talk about here and a lot of my own research um, spans this uh, area. 
Uh, but yeah, since I've been at this workshop on risks of large language models, I'm especially inspired and um, yeah, we'll see what we can cram in that one uh, lecture. And yeah, in the final week, we are going to do the wrap of the second part of the semester, what the final exam is going to be about. Um, I'm yet not sure about the exact format for the uh, exam. Um, it's a little bit harder to um, kind of come up with really good multiple choice questions for the uh, content around the traditional NLP methods. So I will keep you posted about uh, what I decide on how the exam is going to look like. And that's probably going to happen um, early next week. Um, also, uh, the exam is going to be at 1030, not at our usual uh, time. So please be, you know, don't forget that the exam time is when the university tells us we should meet. And that's on Friday, 26th of April at 1030 in the same room. So earlier than usual. Um, so mark this, highlight it, put, put it on a post-it note, do whatever you need to do, but come earlier um, to the exam. And the Wednesday that day is a reading day, so we won't have uh, the class on Wednesday. Okay, any questions about the logistics of the course up to the end? Uh, we still have uh, need to grade your last homework. Uh, since I was out of the time, we didn't really settle on a rub rubric yet. So we are gonna do that this week and try to uh, grade it uh, soon. And I still, to some of you, owe grading of your bonus part for the third homework, which I didn't forget about, just didn't get to do. Okay. Seems like no questions. Uh, then we are going to go ahead with a new topic. All right. So question answering. I feel like this is one of the stars that barely needs a motivation, right? We all feel our information needs by either talking to a virtual assistant or a chatbot. We interact with search engines. We query a databases. Um, so no wonder this question answering has been a major task uh, in uh, natural language processing. However, it comes in many, 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 many flavors and the number of data set and resources we have for question answering is massive. So I'm going to try to distangle along the you know, dimensions um, at which people kind of uh, separate their question answering task from some other questioning task in the field. And this first dimension is the intent behind the question. Intent behind the question well, can be that uh, the person was seeking information they did not have. And this is very common when you use um, question answering in search engines. For example, if you ask, what is the tallest mountain in Utah? You are interested in knowing what is the tallest mountain in Utah. Or uh, we have many question answering resources where we try to test the knowledge of another person. For example, uh, when I have given you midterm exam, those were all questions, multiple choice questions, and I wanted to test your knowledge. And we can do similar thing for machines. So along these two dimensions, we kind of have two tasks. One is question answering, which is more often associated with information seeking questions. And the questions in uh, prototypical QA data sets are real queries by users uh, of products like Google Search or Reddit or Stack Overflow or whatever else. And um, often these questions are kind of ill-specified. You all don't really give fully formed sentences when you search uh, information, right? And there is a lot of ambiguity and presupposition. Presupposition is assumptions we make that we kind of expect the other person or machine to infer. Um, so there uh, also less frequently involve complex reasoning. You don't, you kind of don't have, or at least for years, so we didn't have expectations that machines can understand very complex text. So we usually uh, give um, questions that do not require any complex reasoning, which is changing today with um, conversational search. And questions often assume no given context and are also 
uh, almost never posed as multiple choice. So when you search information with uh, your favorite search engine, you don't give a piece of you know document that you know the answer is hidden in, or you don't um, you know write okay there here is a question and there there are two options. Tell me which one is correct. So in a, in NLP research, industrial research, meaning labs that are in industry such as let's say Google, uh, they have done a lot of these kinds of things in the past because if we make progress on something like this, then uh, that tr directly translates to improved product. On the other hand, uh, so we had these two you know, possibilities that person is seeking information or we are testing uh, the machine's knowledge. So reading comprehension uh, is more associated with so-called probing questions when we probe the understanding of the model as we have learned uh, last time uh, we have uh, met over Zoom. So with reading comprehension, you get a block of text, uh, usually a passage from Wikipedia, let's say, uh, that contains the information relevant to the question being asked. And then you, you get, ask a question in the context of that passage, to probe the model's understanding of some of some linguistic property, usually. All right, let me give you two examples of prototypical QA task and reading comprehension. Uh, so this is the task. Of, uh, uh, this is a uh, question answering in the con in these uh, data set called natural questions. And uh, here questions, uh, this is produced by researchers uh, in Google, and the questions are actual questions people have asked in Google search. So for example, question might be, when are hops added to the brewing process? And the, uh, the right answer is the boiling process. However, um, we will see later, this, this task is also assuming that you will first retrieve a relevant document from a uh, web or some other collection of documents you have. And in uh, amongst this collection of documents, there will be one document here, one Wikipedia article that describes relevant information. And here, if you see now uh, how this is going to zoom in into this passage, this is where the information is hidden. If the answer is the boiling process. But you can also, in the setup of this task, they are also ask, um, provide another version of this task where you uh, retrieve the passage where the answer is uh, hidden, and then you give the entire passage as the answer. So they call this short answer and this one uh, long answer. Okay, um, so that's, you know, question answering that has a very, um, you know, rich history uh, with, you know, idea being that this is kind of what should be um, improving search engines. And then on the other hand, we have those reading comprehension tasks where the goal is to probe the model's understanding of something. So DROP is a data set that uh, in particular aims to evaluate how models can uh, deal with numerical reasoning, but in a given piece of text. So it's not like two plus two equals, and then the model needs to you know, answer what the two plus two is, rather the model needs to figure out numbers in a given text and answer questions about that. All right, so let, let's do this ourselves just to have kind of see how, how hard it is. So. Here the passage is, um, to, to start the season, the lions travel south to Tampa, Florida, to take on the Tampa Bay, um, oh my God, how do you pronounce this? Buccaneers, sorry to any fans of Buccaneers. The lions scored first in the first quarter with a 23-yard field goal by Jason Hansen. The Buccaneers tied it up with a 38-yard field goal by Connor Bart then took the lead when Eki uh, Talib intercepted the pass for Matthew Stafford and ran in, it in 28 yards. The Lions responded with a 28-yard field goal. In the second quarter, Detroit took the lead with a 36-yard touchdown catch by Calvin Johnson and later added more points when Tony Sheffer, Sheffler caught a 12-yard TD pass. Tem Tampa Bay responded with a 31-yard field goal just before halftime. The second half was relatively quiet. Excuse me, guys. Uh, there is someone who entered the Zoom, which is not possible. Um, sorry, uh, the, you, you should not be in the Zoom. Okay. I don't know how. I didn't share it. 
All right. Um, the second half was relatively quiet, with each team only scoring one touchdown. First, Detroit's Calvin Johnson caught a one-yard pass in the third quarter. The game's final points came when Mike Williams of Tampa Bay caught a five-yard pass. The Lions won their regular season opener for the first time since 2007. And now the question is, how many touchdowns were scored in the second half? So can you tell me now what the answer is? Two? Any other guesses? Three? OK, any other? OK, so the right answer is three, because we have here um, in the uh, let me just find the right information. Um, so we have this first touchdown over here, and then uh, which each team only scoring one touchdown. So one plus uh, one plus one, three. So what's your first impression of this? Is this easy? Is this hard? What are your thoughts? Are you impressed that a machine could do something like this? Right, it's it's kind of impressive, right? So very often these, um, you know, reading comprehension data sets that are created, uh, you know, in 2019 or after 2019, especially uh, by uh, certain groups are rather difficult. They always isolate certain linguistic phenomena here, numerical reasoning over text. And the, it's not, you know, it's not easy to to read this text. Like you're, you're, you know, no, you know, the amount of information you need to keep tracking of um, is substantial. You know, when you talk about discourse and discourse entities, there is a lot of discourse entities here, and their properties and situations are uh, involving. So, not surprisingly, for large language models evaluations, when they are released today, DROP is one of the uh, common data sets that's evaluated to kind of demonstrate the advances in large language modeling, because this data set, even GPT-4 still struggles uh, with, with it. So yeah, this is an example of a reading comprehension data set with the goal of, uh, you know, just probing the model's understanding of something. However, the line here between, you know, QA to find information and QA to probe the model is blurry, right? Because you might have been interested to know this information in the real world if you are a fan of this sport, right? So, you know, the, the line is not super clear uh, cut. Okay, any questions? Okay. So yeah, in my research, I also kind of create these data sets. If this is something that's you know interesting to you, want to chat with me more about, talk to me. I created data sets like this. We can, uh, I can, I can tell you more. All right. So um, let's go further. Like there are many phases of question answering. So before we get into modeling, I just want to talk about different different aspects of question answering and try to kind of, you know, um, distangle some of these factors. One important thing to know is that any NLP task can be formulated as question answering. Uh, and this is actually done to leverage model reuse. For example, you train a model for question answering, but then you want it to do some other task, and then you frame this other task as a question answering. So obviously multitask learning, when you want to learn multiple tasks, although they are not necessarily all question answering, but you can frame them as question answering, it makes it easier. And for prompting, right? Remember when I demoed at the end of the first half of the uh, semester, uh, how to do prompting in Hugging Face, and then we looked into how to prompt um, Flanty 5, for sentiment classification, and we prompted with, is this movie review sentence negative or positive? So although the task is sentiment classification, we framed the task as question answering. So in such cases like this one, question answering is not a task, but it's a format. It's a way of posing a particular problem to a machine, just as a classification or natural in uh, language inferences are formats. Okay, so you can you you can there is a legit question answering task, and then there is using uh, question answering as a format. Do not you know get confused by two. And the key distinction to keep in mind is how easy would it be to replace the questions in a data set with content free identifiers. So for example, here 
Uh, you can, uh, if you frame sentiment classification as a question answering, then you can write the, you know, the form. What is, uh, what is uh, the sentiment? I don't know what's this. Never seen this. So uh, what is the sentiment of then statement? And you replace the statement with the actual sentence in a movie review. So you can easily find this, um, uh, you know, kind of uh, frame, Format which is uh, which is uh, you can reuse for every single instance. In, and in that sense, is content free because uh, this this statement over here, this format, doesn't have any actual content. Right? We are adding content by replacing statement with a review. Then there are some um, you know um, in between things where you can use templates in filling, such as if you have question and answering about people, then you can have when was you know person born, and you can replace person with whatever person whoever you are interested in. And then finally, when question answering is truly task, is when it's really difficult to replace to have one question that can cover all the questions in your data set it just becomes you need too many templates there is too much variation and that's where uh, uh the question answering is truly a task not a format so it all boils down to your questions in your data set how many you know patterns there are in between them if there aren't too many patterns then you cannot really, uh, you know, frame them with a single, you know, uh, formulation of your questions. And that's where usually that's a question answering task, not the format. Like in the example we have seen before, how many touchdowns were scored in the second half. Not all of these uh, questions in drop start with how many, and then the rest is something completely specific to this passage and unlikely that you can, uh, you know, use a template for. Okay, questions about that? Yes, please. Uh, why is replacing the person's name more difficult than uh, replacing a statement and classification? Mm -hmm. it's, not, it's not more difficult. I think the assumption here is that your data set is not just about people. Maybe you have uh, questions about people when people were born. Maybe it's also, uh, where was uh, this person uh, born? Okay, then again, you need person. Um, trying to think of an example where instead of person, you need um, to replace it with some other named entity. So, um, you know, maybe going back to example, what is the tallest mountain in uh, Utah? Here, Utah can be uh, replaced by location. And then usually uh, data sets like these that are very, you know, uh, factoid and they are all about basic you know information about people something you might ask about you know how in wikipedia there is that side box where you have the main facts about people imagine you created a data set that just about that right so there is still very limited variation but it's not always just about people so you need a little bit of more you know you have slightly more variation than in the statement Yes, please. Uh, it means that um, uh, here, for example, um, content free, it's, a, it's maybe a little bit too complicated term, but uh, basically you can replace a question by having uh, a question like this one here, where you don't have um, Specific content that's specific to that instance. You can replace the content, uh, namely a review, with this um, you know special tag statement. Um, it's a it's a slightly too technical term, so just forget about what this content free identifier. That's not important. What's important is that can you replace every single instance you have with the same question. So here the question is, what is the sentiment of, and then tag, and then you replace the tag with uh, an actual movie review. Oh. Whereas in actual question answering, you cannot do that because the questions are too different from each other. And uh, their content is super important. So you don't have this one template for everything. So the question is like, is, is it a, what is the sentiment of the statement is the moment? 
Uh, sorry, can you say that again? So like I the function there is like the template that you just format. Yeah, so here when we have template, then the question answering is the format. And we, when we do not have a template that can be used to replace all the questions, then question answering is the task. Yeah. Okay, and this was important because at some point, um, uh, you know, around 2019, 2018, 2019, people have uh, started to, uh, you know, uh, form a lot of tasks, such as even co-reference resolution as question answering. And it started to become too confusing, like what is question answering anymore? And then uh, Matt Gardner uh, had kind of written this paper that's referenced here to kind of separate question answering as a task, question answering as a format, which really made it easier then to, you know, talk about what is question and answering research. Because if we forget that question answering can be a format, then every every all the research in NLP is question answering, which is not true. Okay, so uh, moving along, you know, many phases of question answering, what else is there? There are different types of questions you will see in different data sets. Uh, here are, um, you know, uh, different, um, there are four different types we are going to go over uh, one by one. So um, uh, there are, of course, what we would say natural questions, questions that a human speaker could ask. Uh, so any kinds of questions we have, excuse me, seen so far are natural questions. And very often in literature, people might also mention whether there are yes, no questions, which have only yes or no as an answer, or a VH questions, which start with uh, like when, where, why, and so on. Not all of them need to be like this, but you will just see reading a paper, this is a, this is a data set with uh, yes, no questions. And then you know, okay, all questions here are natural questions, which also uh, which have only yes or no as the answers. Uh, so here, for example, uh, when was uh, Einstein born? That's the example of a nat natural uh, question. However, you, uh, as we as we already mentioned, when we do search information in you know whatever search engine, we usually give you know half baked questions. And uh, for example, uh, when I said what's the tallest mountain in Utah, more often you would just write tallest mountain Utah in uh, Google search rather than the full questions. And these are queries. So pieces of information that could be interpreted as a question, such as here, which year Einstein born uh, uh, is not fully formed question. Okay, uh, now uh, this is the next one are gonna be more uh, common in research and you might not ever heard about them, but it's good to know about them. First one is a uh, closed format. This is a format where you have a mask span that the model needs to predict, such as, Einstein was born in and then blank, and you need to fill in uh, the blank, uh, which would be in 1971, which, you know, it's a little bit confusing because it can also be a uh, location, right? And um, it, you know, because we did talk about mask language modeling, you might think, oh, close format, it was introduced for mask language modeling. And there you would be wrong. It preceded mask language modeling. But when mask language modeling became a thing, uh, because models will retrain in this fashion, it was very fashionable to evaluate mask language models such as Bert, Roberta, the Berta, and uh, any other we might have mentioned in this in this way. And for example, there have been a lot of papers of language models as knowledge bases, uh, where people have noticed that because of the pre-training, language models have again, as I, as I mentioned in the probing lecture. No one told them to memorize any information, but it was a useful thing to do to predict the mask word or the next word. So in uh, parameters of language models, there are people would say that the facts are stored. And there is actually a very you know, popular and mainstream and exciting ongoing uh, research direction called editing tracing or uh, locating knowledge in models where you've given a fact such as Einstein was born in 1879. Uh, you are trying to find parameters, actual you know, matrices where this information is located. And then you can try to edit it in a way that you will make the model now spit out new information. And this is super relevant 
when something changes over time. For example, presidents change every four years. And if you train the language model right before the election, and then you release it right after the election, you want, you know, you want to edit this information without retraining the whole model. And this is something people are doing today. So it's a little bit advanced topic, but um, it's a, something people are very excited about these days. And of course, serves for interpretability purposes as well. Okay, excuse me, I have I have diverged. So we were talking about a uh, close uh, close format, and uh, what I wanted, what I was then mentioning is language models and knowledge bases. People were using BERT or other mask language models in this close format to do this completion, and then if they did this completion well and as good as having a knowledge base of these facts, then uh, that would be an evidence for yeah, you can replace your knowledge base with the language model, which is something that's very attractive because construction of knowledge bases is really hard because it's uh, really hard to collect with humans all the knowledge, all the facts we have in the world. And another more popular, you know, something that's just, you know, maybe something you would see in a research is so-called story completion format, where you give to a model the choices of alternative endings for the passage, and then it needs to choose one of them. And then the incomplete part is thought of as a question. Um, this is useful when you do something which is more like, let's say, common sense uh, kind of knowledge, uh, where you kind of want to maybe have here more complicated context and see whether the model can um, completed well. It's it's a less uh, less popular these days, I would say, but these are examples of data sets which were uh, formed in that fashion. All right. Um, so these are question formats, but then uh, data sets also differed in what are the possible answer formats as well. So again, we have the same, uh, same example and we have four different uh, choices for answer types. The most common one is so called extractive format, and then uh, question answering data sets and their task versions where we have extractive answer types are also called extractive QA. If you also need to retrieve a document that's relevant as the Wikipedia article I have showed you when I was demoing natural questions, then you have a task of retrieval based question answering which is also something known as open-ended QA. All right, so um, with extractive format, you either get by data set creators that give you relevant document where the answer is contained, or they assume you need to build a retrieval component that given a collection of documents or just from the web, finds this relevant document where the uh, answer is uh, is contained. And then you need to answer a question by extracting a span from this document that answers the question. If you instead, uh, given a document, if you do not extract it, but rather generate it, this is not extractive format. And this is now called as a retrieval augmented generation, which we'll talk about in a few slides. Um, the nice thing about extractive format is that evaluation is somewhat easy. There are limited range of answer options because a subs substring of a given document is the answer. So it's easier to define what an acceptable answer is, but it does limit the kinds of questions that can be asked to questions uh, where answers need to be directly contained in this document. So um, we'll, we'll see with the next examples what those things could be. All right, so here, uh, when was Einstein born? You can assume there was some kind of document that we have retrieved and then in a token five was the answer. That That's how extractive format works. Then next one is multiple choice format. Questions for which a small number of answer options uh, are given as a part of the question text itself. I mean, you're all familiar with it. Um, this is the, you know, your midterm exam was multiple choice format. 
And the answers are no longer restricted to something explicitly stated in text, which is nice and very often then therefore used in educational contexts. And um, we, you know, creators of the data sets then have a full control of the available options, which is nice because then you can also uh, kind of um, determine what kind of skills you want from the model and you can test the model uh, on those skills by crafting choices that kind of um, that, you know, finding the right answer would require that skill. Um, however, writing good multiple choice questions is not easy, you know, uh, finding options such that it won't be easy to rule out the correct answer is not trivial. And especially so for machines, right? Because they we have learned with data shortcuts that it is very easy to find patterns that then, um, for example, if your right choice have a high lexical overlap uh, with the you know question, then the mo the model might exploit this to find the right answer. Okay, so here when was ice and bore, you have two options, and the model needs to predict which one is correct. Categorical of uh, a format comes, uh, this is when the answer comes from a, a strictly predefined set of options. I think the most common one is when you have yes or no, um, and it's slightly different uh, than both of these options. You are not really given the choices, but the choices are more or less deterministic. And finally, free form format is, uh, you know, uh, it's uh, when you you don't um, you generate the answer independently rather than choose from either the evidence text or from the choices you have uh, given to the model. Uh, the issue here is that the gold answer is probably not the only correct one. So free format is free form format is used for something a little bit more complex, such as conversational question answering, where questions are really somewhat dependent on the context or on the situation. And then uh, if you have, if you you can phrase it in certain way, we encounter the traditional issue of evaluating text generation that there are different ways of saying the same thing, basically. Uh, so you need to evaluate on the two axes as always, fluency and factual correctness, both of which are very hard to do automatically. All right, so, you know, we have gone over multiple things now. We are now going to enter the modeling. Uh, so just be, what, what you need to gather from everything I just said is that there is a difference between question answering as a format and then as a task. As the task, uh, depending on whether the question seeks information of, or whether the original designers of the data set wanted to probe the machine, there are different, these are the two most common reasons why people in NLP researchers develop a new question answering data set. And then there are different uh, formats that depends on the question type and on the answer type. So when you read a new data set or to you new data set, you always pay attention to the actual format of questions and answer to understand what is the exact question answering type uh, task uh, in for that data set. Like there isn't just one question answering. There are, as you see, many, many of them. Okay, uh, so I'm gonna move into modeling. Are there any questions about many faces of question answering? All right. Okay, so we're gonna start with the traditional pre-neural approach to open-ended question answering. Open-ended means reminder. You get the question, you need to retrieve some documents and then answer the uh, question in the context of those documents. Um, then we're gonna see how this pipeline is uh, turned into end-to-end -end neural uh, approach. And um, we, I have some other things I wanna talk about, but that all depends on uh, on the time we have. And which depends on how many questions you ask. So ask me questions. All right, so here, a uh, traditional approach to open-ended QA, QA starts with, of course, you have a question, and then there is a, this uh, kind of component called question analysis. We are gonna dig into these two, you know, subtasks here, uh, from which you get kind of newly formed query from your original question, which you use to retrieve documents, 
and then given the retrieve documents and the expected answer type, you give the answer to a person. All right, so question analysis uh, has these two subtasks, question classification and query formulation. Classification tries to predict the type of the given question, when, where, who, what. These are the type of questions we could kind of do before more advanced approaches. And the, the way you would predict which type of a question this is from predefined set of types is by using supervised machine learning. For example, uh, support vector, vector machines, uh, SVM with handcrafted feature was a, was a good choice for this. Um, from when once you know the type of the question, you can derive the expected answer type. So if the question type is uh, when, then you can say, well, the answer should be a date, for example. Okay, now for query formulation, um, previously these uh, approaches had, you they wouldn't take this fully formed question, rather they would split it into keywords. And then given these keywords, you would try to find documents that have those keywords or related keywords, right? They weren't able to just directly work with these questions the way we can do right now with, you know, let's say ChatGPT. So to, to find the keywords that are, you know, uh, relevant, that are not just filler words or something that's never gonna be interesting for, you know, finding relevant documents, People have used these methods we talked about in the second part of the semester, like part of speech tagging. We know nouns, verbs, those might be more important. Uh, stemming, um, you don't, if you know, have a plural form and now you have a suffix s, nah, you don't want that because then uh, if there is a singular form of that word in the document, you don't have the match where, you know, you're talking about the same word. Uh, parsing, stop word removal, those were all the things people have used. However, even with that, there was there was an issue, namely this issue of term mismatch, when terms and questions and your documents containing the answer are not exactly the same. So, uh, for example, you might have a query about climate change, and the relevant query includes words like terms like global warming or greenhouse effect or CO2 emissions, but because these do not have any lexical overlap with uh, climate change, such a document would not be retrieved. So at the time, people would do query expansion using whatever resource of synonyms they have, such as um, WordNet or uh, ontologies or whatever resource you have to give you related words to, to your uh, term. So uh, as I said, with climate change, you would, using those resources, you would find all of these additional words and you would, they would add them into your query that you would use for document retrieval. All right, so now we are having our uh, keywords. How do we do, uh, you know, uh, excuse me, we have keywords that we put in a query. How do we actually retrieve the document? And the most common thing you would do is a vector space model. And actually this should ring a bell because this is what led us to the embeddings. Uh, so you can represent the question and each document as word vectors, right? And before we had dense embeddings, they people use sparse uh, vectors such as TF-IDF. Where remember TF-IDF is term frequency times inverse uh, document frequency, where if a word had appeared in smaller amount of uh, documents in a collection of a documents, it would be more important for that document where it appears. And then you would compute the similarity between your query vector and your document vectors. And of course, the highest similarity makes the document more relevant for retrieving. Today, there is a version of this that's still quite popular and a great baseline, BM25, which is basically this model, vector space model with TF-IDF, but you add two hyperparameters to TF-IDF. We won't go into details of this, uh, uh, you know, uh, how exactly, but uh, one of these uh, parameters suggests the balance between term frequency and inverse document frequency, and the other one controls the importance of document length normalization, 
And this to this day is still something you should consider when you are doing retrieving before you opt for more complex uh, approaches. And uh, there are many, you know, how to exactly choose these hyperparameters and all of that. You can see a recent uh, summary of all of these uh, variants that uh, that could be useful. All right, so um, also related to here is something you might have heard in your data mining uh, classes is that, and that's inverted index. Uh, this is the data structure for efficiently finding uh, documents that contain words in the query. Um, so given a query term, it gives you a list of documents that contain the term, but very quickly. Uh, again, we won't go into details of this. This is more or less a little bit more um, it, it's just a, a you use hashing and basically that's uh, that's it. Um, once you have retrieved documents that are you know like for example here for every single document and a given question we have a similarity scores. So then you can rank your documents for a given question uh, by their similarity to the question, right? And then there is a question of which one do you select, and this is uh, you take a top few. Uh, this depends on your computational resources uh, and so and so on. So when once you do find you know ranking, you'd still need to do selection. Okay, how do we retrieve evaluation? So each document returned by IR, IR stands for information retrieval, uh, is either relevant to our purpose or not relevant. So how can we evaluate the retrieval component then? Yes. Uh, maybe first uh, label some of the outputs that we have and we have and say the supervised model. This is about evaluation. So we get from the model, whatever model or whatever rule-based system doesn't matter, gives us um, set from a collection of documents. This mod, you know, component says this is a set of relevant documents and this is a set of irrelevant documents. And in our data set, we know which ones are relevant and which ones are irrelevant. So what could we do to say how good our component is at retrieving relevant documents? That is exactly how many are actually relevant and not relevant. Mm -hmm. Can you give me some more concrete example? When you say similar, like what, like we have seen this in other cases. Like a confusion matrix, like two positives, false positives. Okay, and how, if I don't want a matrix, but I want a single number. Perfect, F1 score. Just because it might not be balanced, otherwise accuracy would be great too. So yeah, don't, don't fall asleep here. This is something you all know. Uh, F1 scores should always be the first thing that comes to your mind. And when I said they are either relevant or not relevant, it's no different than saying uh, in sentiment classification, we know that are some are positive and some are negative, right? So this should immediately kind of in your head suggest that there is an F1 score. So yeah, precision would be the number of relevant documents among all documents retrieved to be relevant by a system. So the system retrieves a set of documents to be relevant and we check which one are truly relevant. And recall is the number of truly relevant documents that are uh, retrieved by the system. And then as always, F1 is a harmonic mean between the precision and recall. Um, there were other measurements that I won't go into for the sake of time. Issue here is that it doesn't really measure the, the performance of system that ranks the documents, right? So we have a set of relevant documents that the model retrieve, but maybe uh, the similarity score for one of them is super high and for the other two is way smaller, but we retrieve top three to be relevant ones. And the, this evaluation measurement would fully ignore that. Um, so there are some other things for now, just know F1 is um, sufficient for your first, at least one um, evaluation uh, measurement of retrieval. But if you go down this, you know, line of work either in industry or in research, you would use more sophisticated measurements. 
Okay, uh, so um, just uh, just uh, going back to where we were. So we had our question. From our question, we had um, found a query, the namely keywords that are going to be relevant to find a document where the answer is. We also have used answer type. So for example, do we expect to be uh, answer to be a date or a person or something, uh, some other entity? Uh, from uh, our query, we have found relevant documents using vector space model. And uh, now given those documents, uh, we are trying to do the answer extraction. Now, how people done this in the past is not really relevant anymore. We now are gonna use our pre-trained language models. I do wanna just emphasize that named entity recognition that we have also talked about after the spring break has been massively important in this step. So just going, you know, reminding you of where those linguistic structure prediction was relevant for the downstream application. Today we do something slightly different. So I wanna focus on what we do today. Okay, so today you have this retriever reader architecture, which is honestly like this figure and this figure are not massively different. Um, so here we have again some question, but instead of trying to uh, necessarily, uh, you know, um, find keywords and expand keywords and do all of those, you know, uh, very, um, you know, handcrafted ways of trying to read the documents, here we are going to uh, do something which uh, relies on vector similarity directly. And then we'll find some relevant documents and then those relevant documents go to another set of, you know, uh, neural network layers that's going to then for us predict what the answer is directly without, you know, getting these handcrafted features such as what are the named entities? What is the expected answer type? But there are more or less the whole pipeline looks uh, kind of similar. You still have question, retrieval, answer, right? This part has kind of disappeared, but um, other things are there. Okay, so first thing is, the uh, first component of this is dense retriever. So TF and IDF, uh, TF, IDF, or BM25, they work if there is an exact overlap of uh, between words uh, in the query and the document. Um, but can't help, I told we we do this expansion, but all of this relies on having good resources. And if, uh, uh, and it is the case today that English models are still, you know, better, the pre-training is better for English uh, language and so on. So today, you know, English is still pretty dominant, but it, it, it was the case before as well that these WordNet and whatever ontologies you have, they were way richer for English. So even back then the, you know, uh, whether you can do the expansions with synonyms dependent on the language you work with. So, okay, um, if this is an issue and given, you know, tools in your toolbox that you now have after almost the end of this, to uh, this course, what can help to handle synonyms? Like what else could we do here? Remember the goal is given a query to find a set of documents. So we have a question, and we have a set of documents. And before we use TF-IDF to find similarity, um, and this required sparse vectors, what else can we do here? That will handle synonym, synonyms. Yes. Bird? Uh, yes, uh, but I want to be, I want you to be a slightly more precise. So, um, maybe tell me what would you do with Bert here exactly? Maybe walk me through that process and I think you will get to the answer. I would probably calculate a decent behavior on a word simulator. Probably, for example, global warming and climate change mm -hmm. would be in the uh, still will be better uh, decent to be able to find away from each other. That's that's exactly what I wanted to hear. There is one specific part, which is you know the the bird is a little bit orthogonal to the point, but you said that embeddings similarity embeddings is gonna be close regardless. Although these two terms don't have a high lexical overlap, 
So this is actually the tool we have here. Instead of these sparse word count vectors, we are going to our, use uh, our dense embeddings. You could be using BERT for that to get these dense embeddings. You could be using the average word to vec embeddings, the average glove embedding. So don't get, um, you know, um, don't conclude, okay, only BERT can help us here, rather any kind of dense embeddings can. All right, so we are going to now work directly in our embedding space. And reminder, what are we what are we doing? Retrieving documents, relevant documents for a query. So there are two ways of going about this, and then I will be, haha, there is third. So uh, anyway, uh, two very common ways are to, uh, as, as you just said, place uh, your query and your document into your pre-trained language model. So here we have, uh, let's say we are using BERT indeed. We have our question and then separate your token and then our document. Um, here, if this was a little bit more precise, we will have a CLS token in the beginning and separate your token at the end. And you put this whole sequence into BERT. And then at the end, you have representation of your CLS token. Great, you can now from that representation that now represents, this is important, the CLS token re representation captures because of the contextualization, because of self-attention mechanism. It captures information about the query and the document. So it's a shared representation of query and the document. So based on this, we need some kind of score, which I have seen before. We just multiply it with the matrix and then uh, use a uh, softmax to get the score uh, for uh, this, um, you know, shared representation of the query and a document. Is that clear? We have seen this in a, you know, uh, different different flavors of this before. Any confusions? So let, let's just clarify this. This at this point should be clear how we are doing this. And if you if you still feel like this doesn't didn't really land, I would rather explain it here than have you be confused for the rest of the day. Okay, can I get the raise of hand who feels comfortable with what's going on here? Okay, what? Okay, all right. So I feel like still half of you are uh, not, uh, not super comfortable with this yet. So I'll go over it again and I will try to go over it slowly so such that you have a chance to interrupt me when things aren't really clear. So here, this is our transformer model. And it's pre-trained transformer model like BERT. So BERT is, um, expect us to have certain format, usually using separation token to separate two different uh, input types. We have question and we have a document. So we separate them with a special separator token. It's not shown here, but we have CLS token here and separate your token here because that's what BERT always starts and ends with. So we put that sequence, a string, into transformer, and transformer does whatever the transformer does, you know, self-attention, feed forward neural networks, and so on. And on top of it, after each one of these tokens, we have a representation, contextualized representation of that token. Uh, we could average them. We could do whatever we want with them to get kind of one that represents all of this. But in reality, all of them, because of the contextualization, are representing the whole sequence. CLS is commonly used because it captures the most about all of them empirically uh, has been shown. So now this representation here is a vector of this entire input sequence. And from that representation, we want to get a single number that tells us um, some kind of similarity scores for, for these two things. But um, we, we, we want to get the score, but the score should be learned, right? So we are going to add this linear layer here, matrix, uh, that we will then going to fine tune. So this matrix over here, together with all the rest of the parameters is going to be high when uh, it's going to give us a high score when query and document are truly you know, re relevant to each other and small score when they are not. 
Yes. Suppose we have a corpus of 100 documents. So mm -hmm. will we run this query and document procedure over all of them? Yes, sorry, I <laughs> took a sip of water in the wrong uh, moment. Yes, exactly. Which is, what? how do you feel about that? Slow. slow. It's going to be slow, so I would personally be unhappy with that, and that's going to be a, a reason why we have this second way of retrieving. So here, as it was just said, for every query, you, let's say you have, uh, you know, a uh, thousand queries, and you have, you know, a uh, thousand documents, you now have thousand times thousand pairs for which you need to put into the your BERT architecture, which is not super cheap, right? This is gonna take a while. And also if you're gonna train it in this fashion, it's also going to take a while. So that's been a big bottleneck. So what people have done instead is to encode the uh, representation of the question and the document separately. What, what is the effect of this? If you are doing it separately, that means that now for it's, it's no longer thousand times thousand, rather thousand plus thousand, because for each one of them, we get their representations uh, independently of each other. Of, of each other. So there, it's not like you're giving one sequence that where the both of them are, but rather we give the query, pass it to the architecture and document it separately. Mm -hmm. From uh, in this approach, you will get the representation of your question and the representation of your document, and then you are going to do the uh, dot product, and that's going to be your score. And then, as I said, I said there are going to be two, but then there is a third one, and this one is pretty pretty popular these days. It's called Colbert, where you do take this approach where you have the independent query and the independent document uh, encoded separately. Um, but then the uh, operations on top of them are a little bit more complex than what we have over here when we just had uh, a dot product. Here, uh, what they are doing is first of all, they are going to uh, do a transformation of the representations uh, that come out of the BERT. And then they're also going to rescale them to unit length. And then for, um, uh, so so let's go over, over this. So for each token in the question, so here, one, two, three, for, uh, for each one of them, they are going to find uh, the tokens in the document that maximize the dot product between uh, the two, uh, two of them. So for each question, uh, for each question token, you find the document token with the highest uh, similarity according to the dot product. So that's the first thing, and then you sum uh, all such uh, uh, dot products that you have found, and that's going to be score uh, between the question and the document, uh, which which then because it's of this a little bit more. Uh, complex way of finding the similarity between these representations that are independent of each other is going to uh, empirically it work, works better. Okay, so just a reminder, maybe like because now we are going dwelling into these like slightly more complex uh, equations, we forgot what's the main point here. Main point is to find given a query relevant documents, and we moved from a vector space model where we work with sparse uh, vectors that give us frequencies of tokens, and we moved into dense representation, namely the outputs of the BERT. So BERT uh, gives us the dense representation of a question and a document, and then we use some vector similarity to score their, you know, how relevant is this document to this question. So this is important piece of information that we now work with these uh, dense representation, hence the name dense retrieval. Okay, so how do we train uh, dense retrievals? Uh, we will have training data in the form of queries together with either relevant or irrelevant passages. So relevant passages are gonna be our positive examples and irrelevant passages uh, or documents are going to be our negative examples. You see, this is a we we have seen a couple of examples where we have this negative and positive examples uh, kind of situation. So remember that this is a very common way 
of training uh, uh, neural networks. Um, so some data set will contain positive relevant documents, which is great because then you have this information and you directly know what's your positive and negative document. Negative sample can be, usually people just take uh, some, whatever is the other, uh, you know, a retrieval system that's uh, they are you know it's either simple or they were trying to be they run this system it gets them top thousand thousand is too many so we know that these are not going to be relevant and we randomly sample from the top thousand uh, examples the reason why you're not just randomly sample from your collection of data set or you know collection of documents is because you you want to want this um the model you want want it to be hard to distinguish between true positives and those that are maybe similar and therefore ranked kind of high, but not truly relevant. If you if you sample something that's completely relevant as the negative sample, it becomes too easy for the model. And this is the case anytime you have need positive and, ex and negative examples for a given instance. You want your you want to challenge your model such that it's good at the test time when you give it you know challenging uh, set of uh, documents to retrieve from. All right, so not all data set comes with the information of what are relevant documents, and then uh, it's a little bit harder uh, because you you just don't want to know what is a relevant document. And here, people use something called relevance guidance supervision, where you use an existing uh, retrieval system to harvest examples that do contain short answer strings. Um, so this comes from the fact that very often uh, the um, when whenever the if you have short answer, then the document that contains the short answer is going to be relevant. With longer answers, it's more difficult. So you take your uh, you take your training examples for which answers are short. And uh, you find all documents in your collection of documents that contain this short answer. And you uh, use a heuristic where you say those are relevant documents. You, you don't know whether they truly are, but you say they are. And then you, um, and if they, if the documents that don't contain the, uh, you know, short answer are your negative examples. And then you train your uh, retriever model with this data. And then you sample from the, that new model, uh, you know, use it as a IR system here. So you iteratively kind of improve uh, what are the positive negative examples by uh, retraining the model. Okay, and once you know, once you have positive and negative examples, you just use cross entropy uh, loss. One thing that's important is that this has to be fast and doing these, uh, you know, dense, uh, dense, uh, embed using dense embeddings and huge collection of, you know, documents you might have is not uh, always fast. You want to have fast implementation, so you usually use this library called FICE, which is a library for efficient similarity search and clustering of dense vectors. All right, any questions about training? If not, we're going to move to answer prediction. Now we have retrieved our documents, retrieved the retrieval module. And uh, now we have, let's say, two documents that are relevant. And based on these two documents, we want to extract the right answer or the top. Let's say we just have one document that is important. OK, uh, so. We have our question, we have retrieved a top document, and now we need to uh, extract the answer from this document. So this is answer span extraction uh, reader algorithm. So um, you are again going to place your uh, question and your passage that you have retrieved as an input to your model, because now, we have retrieved one, two, or maybe three, let's say just one document, we no longer have that issue that things are too slow because we don't need to now extract answer from every single document, rather just the one we retrieved. So here we are going to produce this sequence, a uh, sequence of a uh, question and a passage that's gonna be just a single string that we put into, let's say, BERT. 
And what you need to do here, so BERT is going to give you contextualized representation at every single position. And at every single position, you want to predict whether the likelihood of that token being the start of an answer or likelihood of that token being the end of an answer. And then you're going to combine the likelihoods of start end uh, to kind of uh, get the probability of every single substring in your uh, input. All right. So you are going to, first of all, add some special embeddings S and E uh, that are going to be randomly initialized initially, but during training, they are going to be, their weights are going to be changed. So, and you are going to compute for every single token position, a probability of it being a span start by doing what we always do, which is basically softmax. But here, softmax is going to be done in a way where you take that embedding and uh, make the dot product with the um, with the um, contextualized representation at position i. So you have that dot product, and uh, the rest is should be familiar. Similarly, you also want to check whether that uh, token is what's its probability of being the end of a sum span. And here you're going to use that end uh, embedding. So at each uh, position, you get the probability of being a start and end of a sum answer uh, span. And then to score, uh, the score of a candidate span from position i to j is going to be produced by uh, with this uh, with this formula. You take the dot product of the uh, special embedding start special start embedding with the uh, representation of at the position i and the special end embedding in dot product with the uh, embedding of position j. That's going to give you the score for the span from i to j. And your training loss is going to be the negative log probability of start uh, with a minus a log probability of end. OK, so this is how we do it. Uh, and this is because I believe in 2018 squad, data set had been, rele had been released. It's one of the uh, this mega popular question answering data set that had emerged at the time where you know, pre-trained language models like BERT has also come to the scene and uh, it was massive and then it was massively used for, uh, you know, just showing what we can do with these models. And it also requires extracting from a given document. And uh, so this is very, very common approach and you have done implementations for this. There are a few things to have in mind. What happens when we have the question has no answer? Squad version two had introduced these unanswerable questions to give more challenge to the current models. And here, uh, what researchers do treat the, these questions as having the CLS token as the answer. So if that turns out to be the highest scoring substring of your pass, you know, sequence, uh, then you say that's that's the you know that should be answered, but that doesn't make a sense as an answer. Therefore, the question is unanswerable. So what happens if annotated passages are longer than the maximum input token length, right? Here we have, you know, we put everything in a single sequence and let's say now we exceed the maximum input token length, which is for BERT 512. And let's say, oh no, the answer is really at the last sentence of our document. So just, you know, making the document short, shorter won't, won't be the solution. Um, any ideas, what would you do? So just to repeat, the problem is that the path document is too long. It doesn't fit into the sequence. Yeah. Yes, that's exactly what we do. And then um, there is the only, I guess the question is, um, all right, so we, we process them independently and what are the option as the output, I guess? Um, it's either unanswerable or we find the answer span, right? Uh, so um, 
hopefully then in one of them we'll find the answer spam and the span and then uh, we say that's that's the one we predict but that's exactly what we do so we walk through the document and we slide a window of size max sequence length if i want to be extra precise here i would say max sequence length minus the number of separator tokens which is three uh, then we pack the window of tokens into each next pseudo passage and we process them each one of them separately and then uh, where the answer isn't in a pseudo passage, the model, if it's correct, is gonna tell us that the answer is uh, CLS. No answer is found in this window or the gold label span is marked. Okay, so there's a few details you need to take care of. And finally, how do we evaluate answer span extraction? So, uh, one option is to do exact match. So if uh, we just measure how many for how many questions we predicted the answer span, that's the exact answer span that human annotator had, uh, you know, annotated. But what's the issue with this? Exactly. So it's a little bit too strict, right? Like, I mean, I didn't show you examples of squad, but it's not always like, um, or, you know, um, we, with um, other ones, it's, it's, it's sometimes, you know, you know, article might be the only difference. Like you didn't include the, and now the, you get zero for that, but the whole other part of the noun phrase is uh, predicted. Um, so that would be too kind of too strict and it wouldn't be really a great way to assess. Um, and I don't know whether I mentioned before, but annotating spans for humans and having very high agreement is really difficult. So not even humans agree on the exact boundaries of spans. So what people do in, uh, together, you always report both exact match and top F1 score, token F1 score, excuse me. Token F1 scores, uh, you treat uh, your predicted span and your gold uh, answer span as a bag of uh, words. Uh, so if the answer is uh, the beautiful coast, um, you will have you know three words, the beautiful coast. And then let's say if the predicted uh, answer is just coast, you would then uh, measure uh, precision and recall. You know, how many of the uh, tokens uh, that are predicted are actually in the gold answer. And here would be one out of one, precision would be perfect. Uh, and then recall would be out of the gold, all gold words, how many have been predicted. And here we would have one all over three. And then we, again, uh, F1 is just a harmonic uh, mean. Uh, so both of these uh, is something people will report. And this one is, gives a little bit, you know, uh, it's less strict than uh, than the first one. All right, so let's wrap with the retrieval augmented generation. So here, uh, the way we had approached uh, question answer, extracted question answering, open-ended QA or retrieval-based QA is to retrieve documents then find the span where the answer is. And, you know, that's not really what ChatGPT is doing, right? ChatGPT is autoregressive. Uh, meaning we just give it the prompt, such as who wrote the book, the original species, answer semicolon, and then it autoregressively generates the uh, next token. And it doesn't retrieve documents. That's not what ChatGPT does. And it just uh, encodes all this knowledge and its parameters and uh, generates the words. However, you have probably heard that there is this issue of hallucination, right? Uh, the hallucination is a response that is not faithful to the facts of the world. And, um, you know, this is kind of people who say, well, hallucination has such a negative connotation, but if you are doing creative writing, you actually want your models to hallucinate. So when we build these extremely general purpose models, this becomes a huge issue because at, this, at the same time, you want the model to hallucinate. And on the other hand, you really don't want to hallucinate if we are dealing with, let's say, uh, legal question answering. In any case, it's a not resolved issue to this day. This is still, you know, something that's happening. And this is why retrieval augmented generation has become 
a very, very hot thing right now. Then like there are gazillion startups who whose whole premise is, oh, there are hallucinations. We are going to do retrieval augmented generation in our specific area. So here you condition the generation on the retrieved passages. So again, you retrieve the passages. So the dense retrieval is more or less the same, uh, but the reader part, the reader algorithm is no longer finding the span, rather the, you still generate the span autoregressively, but because you've given this relevant document as a part of your prompt, you know, con you, and your conditioning generation on it, a good conditional generation model should pick up that, okay, there is a relevant information here. Um, all right, so I have a minute, so I won't go into a ton of details. Uh, there is just a little bit of maybe extra information to know about the actual retrieval part when with uh, retrieval of augmented generation, the way it's done today, uh, because our, you know, uh, you all know that now input sequence length is an issue. So what people also do is uh, they take documents, they chunk them in the sizes that commonly uh, language models can process, such as 2,000 tokens, let's say, and then you are retrieving by finding relevant chunks, rather relevant full, let's say, Wikipedia uh, articles. Um, there is this whole webinar by Llama Index, so if you are interested to know this, it's a really, it's really good. I recommend checking it out. It gives you more details, and this is kind of advanced technology, but not rocket science and super relevant in industry uh, today. Okay, so one one more thing I want to say before we uh, stop is that, uh, of course, the longer the context is, the more we can squeeze in and therefore usually conditional generation should become better. So remember when I told you that maximum input sequence length had kind of become currency for how good a model is not like model size is not as as appealing as hearing that the sequence length is now 30,000 tokens like that's more impressive. Uh, however, I want to point you to this paper that sh has showed last year that uh, models prefer information at the beginning and the end of your sequence. So when you give this document that the model should be conditioned in its generation at, it's going to pay more attention to the, in in to the beginning and the end. And then if the relevant information is in the middle, it kind of gets lost. So also how to design, um, th th this is a related issue, how to... Uh, Kind of craft your context is another open research area and i guess why all of these startups uh, exist uh, as well okay so we'll stop here and then we i'm going to talk just extremely briefly next time about relation extraction and we'll talk more about uh, summarization on wednesday okay see you then